Numbers 25, verse 1. And I'll, I'll be preaching a little different the next service. I'm going to give my testimony. But this is, I feel like, when I've seen all these hands raised of their family and loved ones that are lost. See, the 11th hour parable is going to happen now. We're not waiting on it. It's going to happen now. Our children are coming home. Come on. And Israel abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto his judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, And his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zer. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. And I want to preach on a revival of faithfulness. And I want to speak and I want to preach over your backslid kids. And I want to preach and I want to speak over your backslid loved ones. That it's not over for them. Come on. That God is about to step in the scene. Come on. You're not going to be able to put them in this building when they start coming through those doors. Father, I need you right now, Jesus. I need you to anoint me more than I've ever been anointed before. Lord, touch my voice. Touch my body. Touch my mind. Let my ears be able to hear your voice, Jesus. Let the gifts of the Spirit begin to operate right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm not worthy, but I'm so thankful that you've given me the opportunity to preach your gospel, God. God, I'm unworthy, Lord, but you have put your voice up inside of me, God, and I I, I have it burning right now to come out, Lord. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. I come against every spirit of doubt. I come against any, any spirit of condemnation. I rebuke the spirits of sickness and disease right now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. You may be seated. You see, we live in a day and time like no other time in history. Because the things that we heard preached about when we were kids, they are now starting to unfold right before our very eyes. Earthquakes in diverse places. They're having earthquakes in Oklahoma. That's as diverse as you get right there. Wars and rumors of wars. All you have to do is just check Fox News on your phone, and you, all you hear about are wars and rumors of wars. Hunger and famine are running rampant. Scientists tell us that water is depleting at an alarming rate. And there are false prophets that are everywhere, and they're preaching every kind of doctrine imaginable. I've found that if you don't like what you hear at one church, just keep looking, and you'll eventually find a doctrine custom fit just for you. Matthew 24 is unfolding right before our very eyes. This world is teetering on destruction with weapons of mass destruction 
at people's fingertips. Economies are falling and failing, and countries on the very brink of financial disaster. You see, now more than any time in history, the world is needing a solution for all this chaos. One man who will unite, and one man who will bring together the world, who will be disguised as an ambassador of peace. This man will deceive and draw the world into his trap. Instead of peace, he will bring destruction. But I want you to know I believe that we are the generation of the last days. You know why? Because we are fighting spirits that we've never had to fight before. Because the devil knows that his time is short. So he is pushing harder than he ever has. With everything that he can, he will do to bring you with him. He knows that he's doomed to eternal torment. And he not only wants to see you lost, but he wants to see your family lost. But I want to tell you right now, you just rest assured, God will always have a church. God will always have a strong church. God's going to have an on fire church. God's going to have a church with miracle signs and wonders. Come on, God's church, the sick are going to be healed. Come on, in God's church, the dead are going to be raised. God is going to have a holiness church. It's time we fast like we've never fasted before. we got to pray like we've never prayed before. When we come to church, we just can't afford to have regular, ordinary church. But we've got to have an apostolic move of God. I want you to know that people are going to be drawn to this church. The drug addicts are going to walk through those doors. The alcoholics are going to rock, walk through those doors. The prostitutes will walk through those doors. The homosexual is going to walk through those doors. People from every race, people from every culture, people from every background are going to be drawn to our churches in these last days. We can't afford to have just ordinary service, but we must have a move of God with the miracle signs and wonders. Come on, we must have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and fire. The enemy is attacking our families like never before. Every church I go to are the anguished faces of God's people whose families have been under attack. Our sons and our daughters, our brothers and our sisters, our mothers and fathers have gotten up out of church pews, turned their backs on God and walked out into sin. Now I'm just going to tell you, not all the blame rests on the devil. Some of our kids have grown up in homes where it's all right to miss church if you got a headache. Don't get quiet on me. It's all right to miss church if you got a special school function or a ball game. It's all right to miss church if it's something that you really want to do or you're just too tired. We're teaching of tithing and sacrificial giving in the home is non-existent. No longer are the conversations of God and the church are the norm, but they are now replaced by anything and everything of this world. How can we expect them to be sold out when we haven't been sold out? By the time they make it to college, they're not grounded like they should have been, and we lose them to liberal, free-thinking teachers. Can I tell you our most precious commodity is our families? I want you to know the devil knows he's not going to get me back into the bar. He's not going to get me back into the drug house. He's not going to get me back into pornography because he's already tried all that stuff. So what he does, he's sly and he comes at me through my family. How many pastors, how many missionaries, how many evangelists, how many worship leaders, how many faithful saints of God are we going to lose before we realize that we are in a fight unlike any other fight that we have ever been in? We are in the fight of our lives. 
Come on, our most precious commodity is our children. Our most precious commodity is our parents. Our most precious commodity are our sons and our daughters, our brothers and sisters. God is looking for some men and women in the last days to stand up and say, as for me in my house, as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I rebuke every devil that's coming against our families. Come on, it's time some men and women pray with authority and rebuke the enemy and take dominion over the enemy. He doesn't have dominion over me. I have dominion over him and I take authority. The children of Israel, because of their parents' unbelief, have been wandering now in the desert the last 40 years. Through God, they have defeated King Sihon and King Og. Man, no wonder those guys fought all the time with names like that. And they're on their way to the promised land. Victory is now in sight. The land of milk and honey is now in reach. The promises that God had made to Abraham are now on the verge of being fulfilled. They have wandered in the desert. Until finally all the doubters and naysayers have died. And they are now camped at Shittim. And the men begin to commit acts of moral sin with the Moabite women. Then they begin to eat sacrificial meat. And they worshiped and bowed down to the false god Baal. God in his anger wants the heads of the people. And he tells Moses and the judges to kill all who have joined with Baal. Then one of the Israelite men named Zimri, he brings a Midianitish woman named Cosby into the camp of Israel. He brings this evil woman boldly and brassly in front of the tabernacle where all the people are weeping at the door because of the plague on them. Then he boldly takes her to his tent to be with her. Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, grabs a spear And he runs into the tent and thrusts the spear through them. And the Bible says when he ran her through the belly, the plague was ended in Israel. Suddenly God stops killing the Israelites after 24,000 have died. Numbers 25, 10. And this is what God tells Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Phinehas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my, my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Who wants God's covenant of peace? And he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. You see, Aaron, the high priest, is dead. And now it's his son, Eleazar, doing the works in the temple. And his grandsons are coming up to follow in Eleazar's footsteps. And Phineas sees how Zimri brings this Midianitish woman into the camp to his tent. He grabs a spear and he rushes into the tent. And he runs them through. And the Bible says God's anger is stopped because of the zealousness of Phineas. Zealousness means fervent, devoted, and faithful. God not only stopped the death, but he also gave a covenant or a promise of peace to the family of Phineas and an everlasting covenant of priesthood because he was faithful for God. He made an atonement for the children of Israel. In other words, he made right the wrong because of his faithfulness. Can I tell you, the Lord spoke to me while I was reading this chapter in Numbers. God let me know that the reason that I am saved is not because of Nick Mahaney, but because of the faithfulness of my father and my mother. Because of the faithfulness of Charles and Juanita Mahaney, God spared me. Everywhere I go, 
I have people ask me to pray for their children, and I do my best to pray for them because I believe in the power of prayer. But I believe God has given me a word for this last day church that if you'll just be faithful, I'm going to bring your children home. Come on, if you'll just be faithful, I'm going to honor your faithfulness because I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen their seed out begging for bread. Come on, God is calling back his church to an old-time revival of just being faithful. Come on, being faithful. Being faithful just doesn't mean coming to church. Being faithful means it's being a giver. I can't wait to give to God because I've never been able to outgive God. Every time I give, He anoints me. Every time I give, He blesses me. Being faithful means paying your tithes. Come on, you can't rob God of his 10%. Being faithful means being submitted to the authority of the leadership, to the anointing of your pastor, the man that God has placed in your life. Can I tell you, my pastor's James Lumpkin. He can call me this morning and tell me to go back to the motel and don't preach. Guess what? I'm submitted to my pastor because if my family's going to be saved, I'm going to have to be submitted. If you're not careful with lack of submission, you'll plant seeds in your family, and you'll not only be lost, but they'll be lost. Being faithful is holiness. People get scared when you say holiness. My Bible tells me in 1 Timothy 2.8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Not just at church. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Two weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me as I was studying this scripture. The Lord said that wrath is not man's wrath. That wrath is my wrath. Because my men are looking at things in the middle of the night that they shouldn't be looking at. Come on. My men are looking at things on their phone in secret that they shouldn't be looking at. And I am angry because when they walk up to pray for somebody, there is no faith. There is nothing but doubting. Come on, I'm coming against that pornographic spirit that's in the United Pentecostal Church. I rebuke every devil that's trying to attack men's mind with this adulterated mess. We can't come in and lift holy hands if they're dirty. Come on, God wants the men to repent with their hands and say, God, forgive me. First Peter says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. You see, holiness is just as much about being saved as Acts 2, 38. It says they received the Holy Ghost and they followed in the apostles' doctrine. You want to know what holiness is? You look at your pastor. You want to know what holiness is? You look at your pastor's wife. Zimri, the man that brought the Midianitish woman into his tent. Zimri means praiseworthy, or it means my praise in Hebrew. And Cosby means the woman that he brought with her, with him, the teller of lies or liar and deceiver. You see, the Midianites were different. They would wait to name their children when they were older so that they could see what kind of characteristics that they would have. So from an early time in her childhood, Cosby must have been a liar and a deceiver. Can I tell you, for every child that God has given us that is praiseworthy, the devil has a liar and a deceiver waiting for them. Come on, it's time that some men and women stand up in this service this morning and take that spiritual spear and run it through that spiritual devil that's trying to keep our children from being saved. When Phineas ran her through the belly, he cut off the seed of that deceiver in his lineage. You see, there's a solution for our backslid, wayward sons and daughters. And that's faithfulness. uh, Joshua 24 and 14. 
Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers had served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. Or the God of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house. Come on. But as for me and my house. I wonder today if there's some spiritual Phineases who are ready to leave and take on the liars and the deceivers that are trying to destroy our family. I wonder if there's some women of faith because you see women know how to pray to intercede unlike anything that we can do, men. We need some women of faith in these last days to pray for our families. Charles and Juanita Mahaney. My dad has been inducted into the Order of the Faith, which is a very high honor in our organization. We've been going through old photographs and old documents. My mother, Juanita Mahaney, grew up in the projects of Wichita, Kansas. I was, we looked at all of her pictures. All of her friends were little black children. She said, because that's the neighborhood we grew up in. That's why my mom has never had this hang up of, prejudice or racism. And she said that when she was just a little girl, her mom and dad split up in the 40s and got a divorce. You see, nobody did that in the 40s. So everybody would talk about her and her family. She grew up an outcast. Her step-grandfather came back from World War II and became very abusive to only my mother when he would get drunk. She said, I never felt like I fit in with my half-brothers and sisters. I always felt like an outcast. And she said, there's many a night I'd hear my stepdad in there and I'd crawl under the bed or hide in the closet because I was afraid he was going to beat me. Her neighbor went to the First Pentecostal Church of Wichita, Kansas. She invited my mother to church. My mother walked into that church in 1963, and she said, I thought those people had lost their mind. They were running. They were rolling. Come on, we used to roll. Now we're too worried about our clothes getting messed up. That's why I buy cheap cheap clothes. That way I can tear them up. And she said I was scared to death. My mom left. The next week, it was in October of 1963, she came back. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. She was baptized in the name of Jesus. My father, Charles Mahaney, grew up in poverty. I've heard my dad say that the further down the block in his neighborhood you went, the rougher it got. I said, where did you live, Dad? He said, out in the very end of the block in a field in an old bus that my dad put us in to live. His father was very abusive. He was another guy that came back from World War II, and he was a machine gunner, and he'd seen a lot of things, and he would snap. My dad said one of his earliest memories is he grabbed his mother and cut her throat one night, and he said they, uh, they had to hold her, keep the blood from pouring out as the ambulance came. My dad said they lived in a rough neighborhood. He said they broke in their house, and they mugged them. They were so rough. Drugs, crimes, jails, and prisons. I had forgotten this story until this week. My dad said when he was nine years old, he was already an alcoholic, and he was running the streets of Wichita, Kansas. He said he, was, he heard this music playing, and he ran up and looked. He thought it was a carnival or something, and he looked into this building, and it was a Jesus name apostolic church. He said they were dancing and shouting and running around. He said he thought these people lost their mind. He said, somebody grabbed him from behind, and it scared him. He began to cuss and fight. And the guy said, hold on, boy. I just want to tell you about Jesus, and we're, having a, we're going to give away a bicycle tomorrow on Sunday. My dad came back. We got a picture of him on that bicycle he won in that Sunday morning service. He got in trouble, got in a fist fight with a, a little kid, and that same man set him down and said, I want you to hear me, son. One of these days, you're going to come to a crossroads in your life. 
And I want you to remember what I'm telling you. You need to turn to Jesus. My dad said he was eight or nine years old, and he went and laid on the floor of that little bus that they lived in. And he said that night he had a dream. And in that dream, him and his family were walking up this road. My dad said there was destruction to the left, and to the right was a gate with a beautiful city. My dad said he stepped in that gate and turned around for his family, and they waved at him and kept on going. He said a boy spoke to him in that dream, said, son, one of these days you're going to preach my gospel. Brother Scoggins, he didn't remember that dream until January of 1967 when God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And he began preaching the gospel. My dad met my mother at Brother Stanford's church. My dad wasn't in church, and they got married against Brother Stanford's will, to be honest with you. I was two years old. We were hiding in the closet one more night because my dad was coming home drunk to tear the house down and beat up everybody. We snuck out, went to church, and Brother Stanford was a soul winner. The first time he met my father, he knocked on the door, and then my dad had been in a brawl, and he was blood all over him. They'd been up all night shooting dope, and he said, My name's Denver Stanford. I'm here to invite you to church. God give Brother Stanford a burden for Charles Mahaney. He said, if you'll win that man, he'll win thousands to the kingdom. He had given up on my dad. It was this Sunday morning. And God spoke to him and said, you could have won him if you wanted to. Brother Stanford called my father that morning. My father answered the phone. He said, Brother Stanford said, Charlie, we can't wait to see you in church today. My dad said, I'm not coming. Brother Stanford said, that's all right. We're going to send the church at 1 o'clock to your house. We're going to have church in front of your house at 1. My dad said, I'm on my way. <laughs> my father told me that he did not remember what Brother Stanford was saying, that all he did was walk to the front, lifted his hands, and said, God, I can't live like this anymore. God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 1969, my mother and father went to Pittsburgh, Kansas and started a church in a Catholic town. They were persecuted, but they were always faithful. For 34 plus years, my father was an evangelist on evangelistic field. Through the good times, he was faithful. Through the bad times, he was faithful. Never turning their back on God. Even when their own son refused to live for God, they never gave up believing Every church just about I go to, Pastor, the preacher says, if they're older than I am, they says, your dad always came here and said, pray for Nikki. Pray for my son, Nikki. Guess what? He was never unwavering. He was always faithful. He never quit believing. I'm so thankful that my father, you see, on March of 2004, God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in a drug rehab. Come on, he filled me with the Holy Ghost when society said, we're done with Nick Mahaney. We're going to lock him away where nobody can ever see him again. Come on, where family said, give up on him. Where his friend said, it's not worth it. Give up on him. Can I tell you, that same God that saved me in a drug rehab is going to pull your children up out of hell. That same God, come on, that delivered this alcoholic is going to reach down in the bar and start stirring your family. Come on, that same God, come on, that pulled me out of hell is the same God that's going to save your children. It's the same God that knows every hair on their head. Come on, we need a revival of faithfulness. Let's all stand as the musicians come. If you raised your hand, I want you to come to the front. Come on with your lost loved ones. Come on. If you raised your hand, come on, begin to move. God's fixing to take us up to the next level. Come on, crowd up around here. You got a brother, you got a sister. If you're a guest, I want you to come to the front. Because I want this body, this family, to incorporate you in their body and their family. Come on. Do you feel that? God's fixing to restore some faith in some people that have lost faith. Come on, God's using some old drunk named Nick Mahaney, some old drug addict that I, I don't have an education. 
I don't know anything, but He's going to use me today to show you that you can make it. I want us to repent. Come on, lift your hands. God, forgive me of my sins. Come on, tell Him. Talk to Him. God, cover me with your blood, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins, God. Help me, Jesus. I need your help right now. Come on, purify my vessel. Come on, every musician. Come on, every, every singer. I want you to lift your hands and raise them. And begin to repent. Come on, sound men. Come on, raise your hands. Begin to repent. Come on, we need, a, we need it to be unified in this place. Forgive me, O oh God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me, Jesus. Come on, God, move in this place. I want you to hear me right now. Listen to me. Now maybe this is just me. Brother James right here can ask me to pray for his family. And I will pray and believe with everything within me that God's going to touch his family. But maybe it's just me. But when I get down, Pastor, to pray for mine, it's when my faith is at its weakest. Am I the only one? I get down there and I say, God, save my children. I got one son, Jordan. He said that two years ago that he's going to live in an alternate lifestyle. The devil says, he's a homosexual. God doesn't want him to live. My other son, Nick, I just seen him for the first time in two years. Been living out in a tent shooting dope for years. I get down and pray. Man, he's too far gone. But I can give my, my kids' names to Brother James, right? And he can pray. And he's got faith. He doesn't care what hang-ups my children have. He's just going to pray. See, that's the power of the body. Men, I want you to join up with, an, with another man. I'm another man. Come on. Come on, men. Ladies, join up with, with, with some ladies. I don't want one person in here left out. And I want you to be in covenant with them. I want you to promise them. For the next 30 days, you don't worry about your family. I got them. And for the next 30 days, you let them pray for your family. So you can pray. You can, they're going to be a fervent and an effectual prayer. Come on now. I want you to begin to lift them up. Come on. Pray one for another. Come on. Begin to pray the heads of protection around their family. Begin to pray that their children are coming home. Come on. Begin to pray for the next 30 days. You're going to be in covenant with these men that you got their hand or you got your arm around them. Come on. For the next 30 days, you're going to lift them up. And I believe that God is going to ignite a fire. Ignite a fire amongst the backsliders in this church. Come on. Lift him up. Come on. Lift it up. Come on. Because you're turning it over to him. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Come on, I want you to, before you leave, I want you to write their names down of their family that they're praying for. Come on, and they're going to write their their family's names down. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Come on, yes. Oh, if you can use, you can use anything, Lord. You can use. Come on, use me.